could see, these aren't like just people ripping the tents, they stomped on them, and like James said, they just wanted to decimate this camp, and they did a damn good job because the 30 or 40 people that were here are no longer here. Look at this. It was slit and then stomped on. I mean, you know, these are these resistant kind of poles there. They don't go down for the wind like that. Well, the people that run the shelters are definitely not in control. I don't care if it's Friends of the Homeless, I don't care if it's the Open Shelter, I don't care which shelter it is. The drug dealers and crackheads are first, the alcoholics are second, and people with mental problems like me are at the bottom of the list. So we're all kind of tense right now, thinking we might lose our homes. People don't realize that they're close to being like us if they have miss a couple paychecks. Main society don't think we got rights. You know, they done turned around, they've done rode us off. You know, we're the bottom teams. If I, this is where I have to stay, then this is where I'm going to stay until they tell me I have to move. Then I'll pack it all up and move somewhere else. If we don't look out for each other, who else is going to do it? A lot of people don't listen to me. People better get up off their asses because Mr. Middle America. In another six years, he might be sitting right down here with me and wondering what happened to his family and where they are and why he's sitting out in a goddamn field with nothing. Um, what do you think I wondered how people cope with such challenges. How do they manage to survive outside while facing so much uncertainty? For some answers, I tagged along with Ken Andrews, who does the outreach work for the Open Shelter, an agency that provides services for people who are homeless. Ken and other outreach workers were scrambling to fill a newly developed apartment complex for the most vulnerable of those living outside, mostly people with alcohol addiction. The city planned a major sweep of all homeless camps as soon as the weather warmed up. This made winter outreach efforts especially urgent. If you know where uh, Harrisburg Pike is, that one, the place I'm going to take you to is about maybe a half a mile down the street on the same side of the Harrisburg Pike. And that's when I found out I was type 2 diabetic, and uh, they called and told me I was dying from degenerative liver disease. You know? And I shouldn't be drinking it. If not, I mean, my liver's so bad I shouldn't be drinking because of that, but not only that, the, uh, the diabetes. And I just, I can't stop. I just fear, you know? Yeah, I might be, but it still has to be cleaned up because I'm gonna, I don't like filth. And I told him I was homeless and I'm trying to survive. And they gave me a deal for $50 for Ed. Eight to ten man tent. Come inside. I am, um, like I said, I, I went down here. I mean, you know, I, I don't drink. I don't do drugs. It says m my work laid me off because we didn't have no work. And a lot of times when you don't have work, and if I would have kept my nurse's aid license, which I let them expired, I could have fell back on that. But I gotten sick and with cancer. I'm already dead. I already know it, so I don't have much, how much time I got left. I don't really don't care. It's just, it's old as far as my life's concerned. You know, bam. You meet many other women out here. Prostitutes. Mm -hmm. And I I have to tell them to go because most of the prostitutes, and, I, and that's just why I'm saying they have to, any woman that comes out have to be strong because most prostitutes are on crack. Some people broke into the storage factory. Did you hear about that around Christmas time? The Salvation Army, right? Had a storage factory somewhere where they were storing toys, you know, to give to uh, uh, needy kids during Christmas. And these people went and uh, they broke into it, right? But within a couple of days, uh, the community in Columbus they had semi truck loads of toys up in the fairgrounds to give them away to replace that, you know. So, and uh, they raised two, I think, believe it was two hundred and something thousand dollars one day down there with a hockey player that brought in front of the street. 
you know, for charity and things. So, basically, it's a good community. There's a lot of good people here. Had you ever well, thought about trying to get into one of the city shelters? I won't go there. Why is that? They're not clean enough for me. Um, I went there one time. I stayed. I got real sick. I ended up going to the hospital. The doctor then told me not to go back. I won't. So I went to him We tried to help Charlie sign up for Briggsdale. Charlie's friend Jim made it this day, but Charlie didn't. Cancer spreads, you know. The two or three weeks they've held up messing around with me could quite possibly be the time that it took the cancer to spread. As a result of messing around all that time, and being negligent to me, and doing what they had to do, it could cost me my life. You know, I can't get that back. That's my dude. Whatever it takes to look after him and take care of him, I'll do it. I don't care if it's wiping his ass, washing his ass, or what. I'll do it. Each and every day, Lord, I pray, yes, I do. I pray to you, praying for me. Each and every day, Lord, yes, I pray down on my knees, head bowed low, Lord, praying to you, oh, praying for my heart, praying for my soul, each and every day, each and every day, Lord, I pray. All the camps seem to have a leader and a set of rules and regulations. Fred, whom you see here, heads up his camp. Outreach workers named the place Camp Rainbow because of its ethnic mixture. Just being out here, being in the element, doing what you have to do in order to survive, and, and, and trying to kick a habit that, you, that I have and different things like that. Um, this area here has taken me away from that environment mm -hmm. and I'm not in that everyday hustle and bustle of, of trying to, to do what I need to do. So I, I, get the, I have the opportunity to, you know, to give something back. We communicate with each other and do what we can do with each other. So would you say that in a way that living out here is safer? No, I'm, I'm not saying that it's safer, but when, like if you're in the short north area or if you're uh, over by the towers or something like that where, where there is a high drug uh, activity and different things like that. You're going to do what you have to do in order to get what you need. That's right. Okay. You're in the and, and plus then you're on an everyday chase. You're on an everyday chase. You're out there every single day. You're not taking care of yourself. You're not eating right. You're not keeping your personal hygiene up and different things like that. When you're not doing that, that's what makes you, your, your system starts to fail you and you get sick and different things like that. And then you don't want to go to the hospital and you have a lot of people that has a lot of problems. When y'all when, when finally get to them, it's like, oh my God, what have you been doing? Yeah. You know, but out here, when you're around a group of people that are willing to, to do the same thing, that's trying to you know, better themselves, get themselves back into the working society, that makes a huge difference. What about in the, in the shelters, Fred? You in the shelters, been... you're having the same problems there, that, that everyday, um, uh, availability 
of getting whatever you want is right there. Here it's not. Yeah. Okay? Here is an everyday struggle of, okay, what are we going to eat today? You know, where are we going to go to eat? Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get water. We need to um, get clothes. You know, we need to get our clothes cleaned or something like that. I uh, was a Cub Scout and went all the way to be an Eagle Scout. Yeah. So, uh -huh. yeah, there you go. Right, so, I um, used some of the skills that I was taught See? growing up. My main thing was is we had to start cleaning up the area for the simple fact when River, River Patrol comes by, they don't see a bunch of clutter. Now that all over Smart. was there before we got here because right. there was some campers that was here before us and they burn upside the tree and everything like that. We're trying to keep everything contained with our, uh, uh, our fireplace, uh, the barrel that we uh, built our fire in, keep our fires contained and everything. We have one gentleman, he just built a fireplace up by his uh, tent, but he's got a brick wall around it and everything else. I've only been here, it was a little bit after Christmas, um, probably a week or two after Christmas. Cold? I, yeah, it was, it was kind of cold out. And um, I, uh, Ron had an extra uh, sleeping bag in his tent and I spent one night with him and he woke up and says, no, you can't sleep here anymore, you snore too much. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, then he helped me get a tent from the open shelter. and. Uh, I actually, the gray one over there was my old tent, and he put me way back there, and this was where his tent was. <laughs> so the snoring. See? <laughs> I said, you got to get a tent the next day. <laughs> Buddy, don't you think I didn't get him one? You got to go. <laughs> and I said, back there. Yeah. <laughs> People that has a, a, a degree in this and a degree in that, that they're out here. And you look and say, why? You know, um, and and they, they said, I couldn't take it. I couldn't take being in that inner circle anymore where you're you're on a program every single day. As far as the movie that you're talking about, I just want them to show that we are caring and loving people just like anybody else is. That we if we'll give whatever we got to you if you needed it. And that is the God honest truth, because I would. I give you the shirt off my back. The other people's reasons are, are, are their own personal reasons why they're out here. They, you know, something, a tragedy happened in their family. You know, my case, that's what it was. I lost mom and dad very close together, and I had a nervous breakdown and tried to stay strong for everyone else and was hiding it and walked away and, and you know, and just never went back. Why well, I became homeless? Yeah. Drugs. I lost my job. I stole from a friend of mine where I was staying to support my habit and I just got caught you know there's no sense in lying about it yeah you know and uh, I'm paying the consequences now so how, how long have you been here I've been here since August so, were well, you... I was under the bridge first then the wind and cold got too much and I said I'm gonna get me a tent and everybody didn't believe me I said watch I'll have one by today and I did I set it up I set it one night up down there and let everybody get in there except Moses he's the man, he says he's got, he can handle it. Well, you see, he's back here now with us. Mm -hmm. But uh, there, then I came back here, and I was back here a month by myself. Then I seen Fred mm -hmm. up on High Street, and I could tell he was tired. I knew he had no place to go. I said, come on back with me. Yep. I let him stay that one night. I said, we're getting up, you're getting a tent. <laughs> got him one. Ron spoke about gang attacks while he took me to see his neighbor's burnt out camp. We were under the bridge, get ready to lay down, and three kids come down. We just sat up and said, hey, what you up to? Well, they said, we ain't messing with y'all. Well, they went over in the corner, they peed in a can. And we, so we stood up. Here they threw it on the old man that was sleeping down there, too, the, the, the jar of pee on him. But, you know, they, they, they just like to mess with the homeless, these kids and stuff. There's no sense in it. We don't bother nobody. Vicky's companion, Brad died four months ago. Brad was a double amputee Navy veteran who lived under a bridge with Vicki. She's alone now, and the work it takes to survive outside doesn't leave her with much time to grieve. I know. They call me King Kong, because <laughs> I won't take nobody's crap out here. It's so great. They can call me King Kong if they want. And I don't have to be with anybody just because I don't have no place to stay. And that's what they assume because 
sometimes that's what they do. Women get with men that have some place to stay. I mean, I was staying with a person in there uh, in his tent. I get mine on Saturday. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there's no sex, nothing else. I can sleep outside, and we've been arguing because of that. So, you know, hell with him. I'll stay out uh, under a tree or something until Saturday when I get my tent because I'm not going through that. Women don't have to go through that if they can keep being strong. At night is when it's normally a problem, or if company comes through, they'll have somewhere to go. So I rectified this the best way I could. Try to make it as, as sturdy as possible, and it's not going to fall down or anything like that. And, and this is what I came up with so far. Um, but when I met Brad, he needed to help. And then we got in that bed and got out here in Biomas, but I still hope to get an apartment and um, live on my budget, but still want to go and work in nursing homes. I really like the medical field and taking care of people. That's what I'd like to do. Whether I'm going to, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, they're a great bunch of people. Um, well, there's a couple people in there that ain't that great, but Fred mm. and uh, we call Slim, the tall one. Mm. Um, Fred kind of helps keep things calm. If you have a problem, you can go to him and um, he tries to find the logical and easiest way to deal with it without no problems, and that's good. That's good. Um, he says he gets upset, but you can't tell. He's always calm and cool and tries to be level-headed at all times. And then sometimes we cut up, but it's, it's great up here. I've been around other camps that there's a lot of drama and fighting and drinking, and that's not up here. It's really nice up here. They don't think homelessness is a big problem here in Columbus, but be around on Saturday and Sunday when downtown's empty. Everybody you see out walking is basically homeless. That's how you get to know each other. They hang out in the same spots and do the same things, and after a while, the, you know who each other are. The homeless people have more respect for each other than people that have big houses. They don't steal from each other. They respect each other because they're all in the same boat. People don't realize that they're close to being like us if they have miss a couple paychecks. And I had to quit working when I was like 33. You just kind of feel useless when all you have is your job and then you can't do it anymore. Yeah, I don't feel sorry for myself. I just wish that I could have seen a heart attack and stroke coming at such a young age. I worked all the time. I didn't take vacations. I didn't take time off. I went in extra hours. I worked all the time. And it's, there's just nothing you can do now. I can't lie and get a job now because they always want to know why I haven't worked since 95 and my doctor wouldn't release me to go back to work. So nobody will hire me now. You're just stuck here. Yeah, I did have a saw, but... I'll try to break that one. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, break the tree breaker. That's good. Oh, I was when I was a kid, growing up as a kid, we used to live in a little town called Richwood, Ohio. And we used, we used to live in... We was living in the house, you know, it was a white house, it was a two-car garage, and we had a flagpole out in the middle of the yard with a little brick around it. And um, old James gets up in the middle of the night and <laughs> gets a bucket, stands on it, and uh, reaches for the matches on top of the cabinet. I burnt down half the house. Just like you did here? No, no, I burnt inside the tent. Oh, that's your home. No, that's Fred's home. <laughs> You're looking at Holy Name Soup Kitchen, where Fred's camp and 800 other people have lunch each day. If they miss out on lunch, they go to various church programs, including the Broad Street Methodist Church, where the open shelter staff serve dinner. Uh, yes, sir. To 
and we uh, come here to get stuff to get us through the next couple of days. The food pantry they gives us wood packs. And if you live out on the, if you live out on the land, we can get one um, wood pack a week. Sometimes she allows us to get two. Then if she really likes us, she'll let us slide through a couple of times. <laughs> If I, if, I, if I say like rare, you know, she's, she, she'll jump on me. Step over this <laughs> but a lot of the food is donated. She's getting your package together right now. Um, uh, food is donated from different uh, organizations and different things like that. And Sister Frances and her team of workers turn around and try to get as much of it out for, for everyone that, that needs it as quickly as possible. Today, People think they're better than other people because they live better, you know. And they look down on a lot of people that's out that don't have as much. And that's, that's a shame, but people do do that. But poverty is bad now. But it's mostly because people don't have the jobs. You know, back then, you get a job. No matter what you did, you get a job doing something. But today, it's not like that. And if you're a street person and you're got a felony against you, or you've been in jail for one reason or another, people won't hire you, you know. So that puts the poverty level here. And if a per, you know, even a man and woman that's married and have a family, they're working two jobs to make, a, to make ends meet, because things are so ungodly high that they can't afford it. Fred left, Fred left. Everything went to hell in a handbasket. He kept order up here, he kept the clean up here. Everybody, even if they didn't want to clean, they pitched in the clean. I mean, it, it's terrible up here anymore. This is not Camp Rainbow, this is Camp Hell. Well, as the wood turns, that's exactly what this is. This then went from a decent little place to live where everybody respected everybody to a little painting place where everybody's trying to story on everybody else and start trouble and fight and be something they're not. Besides, we don't know where he's at. Can you come back next week? No. And he's been suicidal. They let him out of net care the next day. So, what's wrong with them? And that's James didn't, you know, he, they didn't piss him off and he didn't switch up on him real quick. He was out cutting down trees. He, he spent four or five hours cutting down trees and chopping up the logs, and, and then he didn't have no episodes. Uh -huh. and a lot of problems I have in the camp is because the guys over there knows that my dad abused me for nine years of women, nine years of sexual abuse, and four years of physical, and then you beat my mom when I was a kid, and I couldn't handle it. A week after you guys came up there, on a Monday, I went up to get my money, and me and Fred went downtown, and I went shopping, and got spices and stuff for the camp, you know, and Fred says, can I uh, borrow some money? And I didn't ask him how much he needed, so I knew what it was for, so I gave him $20 out of my $50 I had left over. So I gave him 20 and he says, well, thank you. I'll pay it back to you. Well, that night, I didn't buy no crack at all. I tried to fight myself and I said, no, I ain't buy no dope. I bought beer for the camp, but I didn't buy no dope. But uh, he took off and he never came back and he hasn't been back since. Fred now is, the way Vicky and Ron explains it when I've seen them last was that Fred's face is sucked in for being the doorman for the, door, the dope man's house. You know, and Fred wants me to come over and see him, but I ain't going over in that neighborhood. I don't, want, I don't even go over that church neighborhood. I don't even go there to go to church. Because you don't actually have to go to church to believe in God. You read your Bible and you pray and have the faith that the Lord is going to help you. I was up in the campsite behind beds to the point where people was taking advantage of me every week because they knew I was going to get my money and they wanted me to spend it on crack. And I was tired of it. So I came down there because now I'm in the tent site where I can actually live and, and have a good time without using crack cocaine and smoking marijuana and 
drinking's not bad, but the drugs is what kills me because of my mental health. I can actually get back into camping. Not actually being homeless, but camping. Vicki developed a relationship with Tommy Foster, whom you see here. Tommy grew up in Columbus with Fred and was distressed over Fred's relapse into drug use. He agreed to the following interview, hoping I would intervene. City Council suddenly announced plans to bulldoze all homeless camps, starting with those on the Whittier Peninsula. The Parks and Recreation Department would have to renege on a promise that gave these two men permanent residency in exchange for policing the area. Several, it went to all the national publishing houses because Associated Press was here right after it. 10 News the next day, Associated Press the next. It's going to be pretty, hey, but I, I, I This is my paradise right here. I know, I know it. I love it down here. I know it. And you I built, built it with my hand. You built it when it was just a little box, then we, you put this on it. Yeah, yeah. I'm losing my eyesight. You got it. Go check it. At least go check this thing out. Hey. 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 <laughs> You should go at least hey, to look at this. Baby. If you don't like it, I, I mean, you know what's going to happen here. Gonna, they're going to they're do this up. But I mean, uh, if you don't like it between me and you, I'll pack up what you can go. I'll get a trailer, come down here. We'll go out here. Well, I got 40, a truck. 40 miles out in this freaking country. We'll yeah. go out there. But at least go see this because I think this is something that I put other friends, and you are friends, but this is a place where if you want to have a beer, you want to have 20 beers. But if you come out in that, that hallway and go, mother oh. I'm going to blow the blaze up. They're going to be a social work going. Well, he Roger. won't do that. Well, no, that's no, what I said. Type. They assume their ass yeah. off. They come down here. Yeah. I had a girlfriend, Bridget. Is she a runaway? And I'd have my kid down here, and I'd have I trust that man with everything I got. With my daughter, I got a seven-year-old girl. I leave him, leave her with him. She, he treated her good. Just in the church group. Someone in the church group called the police or something? You told me about yeah. it a couple years ago. They came in here. Uh, I was ready to fight both the cops. I said, you jerk that pistol and miss. You'll never shoot again. You want to see another road? I built, I took about, I'm figuring about 15 tons of, uh, of rock out of Columbus scrap. Peanut, you guys come with me so she'll feel safe. I'm going to show her the road over here. Right here is our first road. You know? See the rock in there? I had to layer it and layer it and layer it so it stand up. You know? But they gave us the okay to go ahead and tear that out over there. We had a good road. They even graveled it for us. This is Princess Maria. Well, yeah, that's it. That's Sissy. Oh, Sissy, I can see really well oh, with wow. the camera. God, I had really... him ever since they was little babies. Yeah, wow. they, hey, these aren't kitty. these aren't even cats. These are like kids. And these yeah. are my kids. Oh, they're gentle. Yeah. Uh, very gentle. Yeah. Blackie, he's a stray that came, girl. and I started feeding him, so he I moved in. I used to see him in the yard, and he's he started getting closer. He seemed he was friendly. He's a big one. He was a wild mean cat. 
Look at that. Oh, that's my mommy. goodness. That's Mommy Kitty. <laughs> that's uh, Mommy Kitty here. Oh, my uh, She's mine. I'm taking her to my house. <laughs> oh. Oh my God! But I take the strays That's in a and feed them. That's a pound cat. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> this is the problem, and it is a, it is a dilemma. It's like watching lead. When you deal with HUD, HUD allows you to have one pet per house. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. That's right. This place that we're going to put him is HUD financed, yes, but it's animals? CHN, and the animals have to go. He has animals. Oh, it's about cats. six cats. I'm telling you what, I, I don't leave my cats either. I know. Mm -hmm. And I am a cat person and a dog person. And I, am I leave my man, but I leave my cats. <laughs> so, I mean, how long have you been living on the land? I've been here for almost three and a half years. Where were you living before, if you don't mind? I was living with my mother, and she passed away. And my fiance kicked me out. She called the wedding, wedding off and everything, and I lost my job I had for 24 years. Wow. What kind of work were you doing? Look, I'm marble and tall, granite, oh, and marble. Oh, wow, yeah. And I just came down here, and when the water house was there, they had a set of steps over there. I stayed under the steps until I picked up pieces of wood and built me a eight by eight, and then I added on and everything. Nice, got a window, and this is yeah, that's bulletproof nice glass there too. Wow. Do you notice the sign? I know, I love the sign. <laughs> yeah, she got that <laughs> last yeah. time. I love the sign. <laughs> this is the porch. No alcohol beverages beyond this point. And that's where I do all my drinking at, <laughs> inside. Summertime, I'm out here in my Daisy Dukes with a beer. <laughs> Daddy's baby. Kitty pot. I got catnip, I call it kitty pot. Let's go back in here. You know, I feed the birds. I get bread and everything. I feed my birds every morning and everything. I got a little squirrel that comes out here and she likes cookies. Uh -huh. <laughs> I had a, a, a coon down here a year or so ago and I called her Cookie Coon. She'll come right up to me and take oh. a cookie out of my hand oh, and sit really? there and eat wow. it. You know, I'm a nature lover. Yeah, I am too. I but love animals. I gotta go, I gotta go. You know, that's bad for your health. The, no, cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's drinking. <laughs> uh uh, that's what's keeping me looking good. Yeah, there you go. Well, I'm 62 years old. Are you like really? My beer. Yeah. There you go. But I ain't seen what you've seen either. When you go see your mother and you hold her hand and she opened her eyes after three days, not eating, not nothing, looked at me. I love you. I said, I love you too, Mom. Wow. If she died in my hands. God bless her. Hey, that's your best friend right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but go on that side of the door and don't come out and don't, you know, I mean. I ain't room. no troublemaker. That's right. I wash my clothes out in the bucket. Well, well, you're going to have to domesticize yourself. Don't, man, don't spoil me. <laughs> you won't have to do that. What's wrong with his shirt? It's all starchy. Look at this stuff. Oh, man. I'm just saying, you want to come out. Now, let me explain something to you. I don't have to use my John over there no more. This is a toilet. Well, how do you work that? I know. We're going to go through an extensive, extensive training program out here. It's called Flush. Oh, wow. man. I got an outhouse built where I mat, and I don't have to flush or anything. When it rains real hard, the water backs up and washes it away. I made a mistake. I tried to kill a guy. I done eight years and two years on papers. I learned my lesson. I was on drugs. I don't what was your no drug drugs. of choice? What was your drug of choice? Coke. Well, you lay it down. I'm a hippie from the 60s. I've been there, done that. Coke, buddy. Yeah. Powder or smoke crack? Hey. Powder? Yeah. That's why I ain't got no muscle here on this side of my nose. You burn that bad boy out. Manitou. It's out. Manitou. Over ain't here, <laughs> got it. Over here, I don't. I've done speed. I eat all kinds of pills. When I found out mom was getting ready to leave me, yeah. she had uh, syringes of uh, what they call it, soda pentothal, whatever it is, numb the pain. 
I took some of those. I took a bunch of pills. And I was talking to my fiance on the phone. And my words weren't coming out right. She had the cops and the squad and everybody beating on my door. And then they've seen the uh, condition I was in. They took me to the hospital, pumped my stomach and everything. Suicidal. They put me in that nut here. That's what everybody calls it. Not nut here. Nut here. No. I'm not homeless, I'm a drustless. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I rewrote the book. We rewrote the book on homelessness. Why is that? If we live out there, don't go there. We don't invite crackheads, we don't invite drugs. We do drink a little bit too much, but it's heavy right now because it's kicking us out. This has been three different scrapyards since the Civil War. For 1945, at the end of the war, Handler and Son came in. Was Columbus, then, 1945, Handler Sun went out. Columbus Scrap came in. Scrap yards must not move much. There ain't a lot of knowledge what's left in the ground. Castle on them, castle on them. How did you learn all of this, Sam? Well, when I first came in here, I was out of work. I'm looking over here as I'm excited, a little Sundance car. This man, it's got to be some money over here. I started taking five to seven, all I knew was aluminum. Yeah. I started taking five to seven hundred pounds in a day, up the top of the ground. Steel pipe, cast aluminum. Over the course of the day, I really sat there and tried. I can make two hundred fifty dollars in one day, but it gets old. Sheet iron, one hundred five a ton. It's way up, more cheap. Don't know die cast, you can always tell. You scratch it, takes a harder metal, scratch a softer metal. See how shiny it is? The guy that picked apart the rail crane, they scrapped it. It was right there, first summer I was in here. He said, oh, my guy's telling me you've been in here all summer. He said, how much you taking out of here? I said 12 to 15 tons so far. That was off, off the ground, all my embarrassed. And he said, I'll tell you what, I said, it's getting hard now. I said, it's getting skimpy. So I'll tell you what, I'll dig you a couple holes. He sunk that son of a bitch in the ground, had stainless plates came up, big brass bows, aluminum. God, it was one hour. I had over $175, I remember that much. One hour, picking it up off the ground. Cast. So each one of these piles represents where well, see, you digging have been digging. Uh, you, I always throw my dirt behind me. You, won't, you don't throw it where you ain't dug yet. Throw it where you already dug. That way you don't have to contend with it again. Yeah. I can show you. If you want to go down there, don't worry. You're safe with me. Down the other end of the yard, I can show you where I got my largest piece at. 5,300 pounds. Hey, Larry. So, so there you were telling me, are you like me, a Columbus guy? Are you born and raised here, or? No, I've been here since about 1988. Came down here when my wife, and myself, split up. Yeah. Things didn't go so good. <laughs> so. You've been able to get help? That's a joke. How so? Because everybody sometimes people tell you they'll help you and you more their idea of help and your idea of help are two different things. So oh, what do you got? I got some my truck. I'm alright. I don't want to do anymore. I pretty much get enough. Don't do that, Larry. I get my hopes up for something. Yeah. I 
I get my hooks up and nothing ever comes of it ever, ever. I always work before I... Uh, what kind of work did you do? Auto mechanic mostly. I'd do anything, but that's what I did mostly. Worked in some factories just before I got separated from my wife. You know. Never had been on public dole or anything like that much. I've got a stepdaughter. A little girl of my own, I haven't seen her since 1988. Yeah, that's got to be hard. I don't think about it anymore. Yeah. Said there's gonna be a battle with the devil tonight. I got ammo he can't handle, that's right. I use the good book as a sort of shiny light. Cause there's no way that he can win, cause I've got God. There's no way that he can win, cause we've got God. And they're talking about bulldozing us all out and making this an aviary, a bird sanctuary. I done told him, they'll have to take me out by force. This is my home, uh, and the police told me, just make them remove you. Sit right here and make them forcibly remove you and you got a lawsuit. Well, I mean, we ain't got no choice. What the hell they want us to do, walk off the face of the earth? I mean, everybody got to be somewhere. I mean, just because we ain't got money, we don't, we, we, don't, we don't deserve to live on God's green earth. That's a bunch of crap. You, you know, it, it, this needs to happen. There are soil contamination issues that have to be addressed, and, and there's no way that we can clean up that contamination um, and have Roger here you know, for his safety. Uh, so it's inevitable that today was coming. Um, you know, I've, I've learned a great deal about this entire issue of folks living on the land. and. You know, Roger's a good guy. Yeah, I had to take all the heavy ones. Ah. Okay. Well, since he's the only one I'm wearing about Deezy's outside cats, they'll follow me when I walk back down that way today. Okay. Okay. Big old mommy kitty again. Mommy, mommy. Mommy kitty. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Mommy kitty, come here. 
Mommy, come here. Come here, Mommy. I gotta get her out of here. Come on, Mommy. gonna get ran over by equipment. Here. He's been around. Three and a half years down here with me. Since I've been with Charlie, since we've been hanging out, he's taught me more about life, about living off the land, about getting by than I ever thought I would be able to learn from somebody else. Because he's been there and done that, and he's got a shitload of t-shirts to prove it. He has a heart as big as the outdoors, where he likes to live. He enjoys living on the land. He'll give you the shirt off his back if you need it, and you don't bullshit him. If you're straight up with him, because that's what he is, he's a straight up real man. He doesn't bite his tongue, he doesn't stutter, he says what he means, and he means what he says. And all that wrapped in a nutshell is my best friend. To have, sit down and have a conversation with Charlie, looking, looking like he does on the beginning of this film, you wouldn't expect some of the stuff that comes out of his mouth, because he's by far not a ignorant or dumb man. But he only has a seventh grade education. But he's so smart and knowledgeable in other regards that it just, I mean, we, I say things because I'm, I consider myself half, half ass educated and street smart. And I can hold a conversation with him and say things like, when only, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. And he'll finish it up. He'll say, Nietzsche. The first time he did that, I was like, what do you know about Nietzsche? He said, I know a little bit. And he started smiling. Because he's got a unique smile, too, because he don't have a tooth in his head. What would you say, sweetheart? You doing OK today? I'm doing OK. I'm... Hey, baby. I'm doing OK. I'm on the last leg, Mary. I know. The very last one. I got a feeling it'd be over for long. You know, Betty does, everybody does. Probably a matter of days. Could be hours or anything. It's that close. Charlie Haddock died, surrounded by friends and family. Shortly after, I received this shocking message at home on my answering machine. Hi, Mary. It's Vicki. I'm in Mount Carmel West, um, room uh, four towers, oh, five. The phone number here is uh, 234-1120. I fell off the trestle last night, and Tommy jumped in to save me, and he died. Call me when you get this message, please. Need someone to talk to? Bye. Both police and family are using the word hero to describe Thomas Foster. Early Saturday morning, Thomas and his girlfriend, Vicki Darce, were found in the Scioto River. They had been hanging onto a support post for four hours. Thomas had jumped in trying to save Darst after she had fallen in. When rescue arrived, the woman was able to grab onto the buoy and be pulled to safety. But police say Thomas was too weak and cold from the 55 degree water. His body was found five hours later. I don't know where his strength went or why he got so cold and so sore. It, like you said, he might have just gave up because they got there. 
I think you only stayed there with me to keep me safe. I don't know. It's all so confusing and I can't handle it. It don't make sense to me, Mary. I don't understand why I didn't have no more strength. Our house cubby went down the second time and didn't come back up. Our house cubby, they didn't jump down in the water and try to get him. They had a life raft down there. One of them firemen could have jumped down there. I've seen them do that on TV all the time. I understand why they didn't jump in the water. They had stuff to, to rescue themselves and them. I have never dealt about losing Brad. I never dealt with that, and now I've lost Tommy too. And Brad was sick. He was so sick for a long time before he died. People treat you different when you're homeless. The Veterans Administration wouldn't help him, and he was a vet. I don't understand why two good people would be lost. So young. Tom, oh my good friend Tom, we lost him on the bridge back there. And he's one of the reasons, um, Open your eyes I, uh, when you had asked me to do a song for you. I'm sitting there, you know, you know how I used to always sit in my lounging chair. Uh, and, and I started singing it and he was in his tent and he comes out of his tent and he says, Fred, that's the one right there. Work on that one. And when we lost him on the bridge uh, while he was holding someone else up, I mean, me and Tom, we grew up together. Uh, swim teams, lifeguards boxing, football, wrestling, everything. Um, I miss him to the bottom of my heart. I think about him often. People in the whole, we need to open our eyes up and, and look at what's going on in America. Look around the city. Have you taken the time just to see who he is? Standing right there, you see them every day. Standing on the corners, oh yes you do. You see them every day. Standing on the highways, oh, and the byways. Holding their signs, saying now work, work. For food, I'll work for food. Oh, have you seen him? Oh, you've seen me, he too. Let's try that one for now. <laughs> 